Welcome to His Gospel Christian Fellowship. It's an honor to have you join us in worship service today. We invite you to visit us virtually at any time. Our mission is to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to love and support one another in our Christian growth. We are not here to judge, criticize, or condemn anyone. We teach, preach, and live God's Word and God's Word alone.
afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the United States or in the world, welcome to His Gospel Christian Fellowship. We thank our musicians and singers for the song that we just heard. God is truly worthy of all of our worship and our praise in all that we do. We should give him praise. And we're going to be talking about that today and in the next couple of sermons that I bring to you, how we can worship God and what we're doing. And in this particular case, we're going to be talking about something that we may not understand or realize that we are doing or should be doing. But in our lives, this is something that God is calling us to do every day of our life, and that is building or rebuilding those things that are broken. So first, we're going to go to the opening scripture, which comes from Psalm 100. I'm going to read it to you from the King James Version. And the psalm says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. I'm going to read that last verse again. It's one of my favorite in the entire scriptures. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his word. So let's, let's jump right into the sermon. Um, we're going to be looking at the book of Nehemiah not only in today's sermon, but we've got four parts to this sermon. So today is part one. And this is a fascinating book, and there's so much to it that there's no way that you can do it justice in one sermon. As a matter of fact, I would invite all of you who are listening to this sermon to join us in our Bible study as we are starting and we are working our way through the book of Nehemiah. There's so much there that Again, you can't even do it justice in a few sermons. If you really want to get what God is saying to us through this book, you have to delve a little bit deeper, and that is what we will be doing in our Bible studies. Bible study is every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So we invite you, and we will give you information of how to join us uh, via Zoom for our Bible study so you can Follow along with us and learn even more as we are studying this book. Before I get into reading any passage from Nehemiah, I want to give you a little context. Basically, in uh, 607 before Christ or BC, the Babylonians came into Jerusalem and they destroyed the city. And it was their custom with their prisoners, with those that they conquered, to break those families apart. So they took the families out of Jerusalem and, and, and out of Israel, and they sp scattered them throughout their uh, empire, the Babylonian Empire. However, in 539 BC, the Persians came in and they conquered the Babylonians. They had a different philosophy. They were okay with people going back to where they came from, as long as they understood who the boss was, as long as they understood that they belonged, if you will, to Persia, they were okay with the Jewish people going back to Jerusalem and to their homeland. Some of the um, Hebrews went back to Jerusalem, but keep in mind, the city was destroyed by the Babylonians. There, there wasn't much there. Uh, there the, the city had been burned to ruins. The, the um, temple had been des destroyed, desecrated, and the walls of the city, and in those days, you measured the strength of a people and of their cities by the, the integrity of the wall that surrounded the city. Well, there was no wall surrounding Jerusalem. But some of the Israelis, or excuse me, the Israelites went back anyway, and some stayed in Persia. 
Some stayed in Persia because even though this was not their land, even though this was a foreign place, even though they worshiped gods that they were not familiar with, they had customs that they were not familiar with, but they had been there for a while now and they got comfortable. They got comfortable living in a strange environment. They got comfortable living in an environment where things were going on around them that they knew were not pleasing to God, but they were comfortable. And it sounds very familiar, just like we are today. So the passage that I'm getting ready to read to you and the whole story of Nehemiah and what he did takes place in about 445 BC. And this was a person, Nehemiah, who was still in Persia. And as a matter of fact, he had a pretty comfortable job. He was the king's cupbearer. And so he did not have any real reason to disrupt his comfortable life, except that, as we will see in the passage, he got wind or got word that things were not going well for those who had returned to Jerusalem. So with that backdrop, let's go ahead and go into scripture. Please meet me in the book of Nehemiah, that is in the Old Testament. And we're going to read uh, 11 verses of the entire first chapter. And I'm going to be reading this to you out of the New Living Translation. The word of God says thus. These are the memories or memoirs, excuse me, of Nehemiah, son of Halakiah, in the late autumn, in the month of Kesleth, in the 20th year of King Arxaxerxes' reign, I was, the, I was at the fortress of Susa. Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I, was asked, I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses, if you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. Oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. Again, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. So again, we have, we see here with Nehemiah that he has gotten word from his brother that things were not going well for those who had returned to Jerusalem. Now, as I stated earlier, he's in a pretty comfortable position as the king's cupbearer. He's got a good job. He lives a pretty good life. He doesn't have to do hard labor. He could like so many people even today who hear of the misfortunes of others, even their own people, sometimes their own family, when they hear about people not doing well, when they hear about things going on in society that's not beneficial 
to a number of people. They hear about bad stuff happening, but it's not happening to them. And Nehemiah had the same choice that we have, which is he could say, sorry for your luck, too bad, too sad, glad I'm not you, it's not my business, I'm doing okay, why should I get involved? Or when he heard about this situation, when he heard about the distress, when he heard about the trouble that his kinsmen were going through in Jerusalem, he went and said that this is something I need to do something about. He felt the spirit of the Lord come upon him and tell him that this is something that I will want to rectify through you. He wept and he fasted. He felt the pain of those that were going through the distress that they were going through. And that is one of the first lessons that we need to learn is that when we hear about something that is not going well for others, even if we in our lives at this point are doing pretty well, that it is our brothers, we are our brother's keeper. It is our business to take care of our brothers and our sisters. We have to get involved. We have to do something. We are the instruments through which God will bring deliverance many times to those that are in need. We should not look at someone else to do it when God is calling us to do it. We see in the prayer that I just read that Nehemiah prayed, there were four things that he did in his prayer, which we should do in any prayer, but particularly when we are going to God for guidance for a mission that he is sending us on, when we are looking to him to guide our paths and to take us in the right direction to accomplish a great work. The first thing that he did is he showed reverence in verse 5. He showed reverence to the Lord. He said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, he called God out as to who he was. He made sure that he gave God the, his proper due before he asked for anything. That's something that we can learn to do better in our own prayers. Instead of starting our prayers with a laundry list of what we want God to do or orders that we want God to follow, we need to start out by acknowledging who he is and giving him his proper respect and reverence before we ask for a thing. Second thing he did is he repented in verse six, verses six and seven. He basically said, yes, we have sinned. We understand why we're in this situation. It's because of our own behavior. It's because of our own actions. And this is something that we should do as well. Many times we go to God and we ask God to get us out of trouble without even acknowledging the fact that we're the ones that got ourselves into it. It's just like when your kids do things that you told them not to do, and then they come running to you saying, you know, please help me, help me. And you're going to help them as their parent. But at some point you want them to acknowledge that I caused this and I've learned something from this and I'm not going to allow this to happen again. So Nehemiah in verses six and seven repented. He acknowledged their sin. He came right out and said, we've done wrong, and this is why we are where we are. And then verses 8 through 10, he remembered. He basically remembered what God had said to Moses. And basically, God told Moses, if you guys do wrong, I'm going to allow you to be scattered. However, if you repent, you are my children, and I will bring you back to that place that I gave you. You have to know what God says. You have to know his word. You have to understand what God's promises are before you can go back and try to remember them. And too many people who, I will say, go to church, I'm not sure whether they're Christians or not, but they want to say that, um, you know, God said this and God said that, but they don't remember the whole passage of what God said. In this case, Nehemiah acknowledged the fact that God said, if you do wrong, I'm going to let what happened to you happen to you. But if you do right, I will bring you back. Too many of us want to remember that B part. God, you said you would do this for me. God, you said I, you would do that. But we don't want to acknowledge that he said that if you do wrong, and this goes back to the repentance part, we need to acknowledge the whole package there. We need to acknowledge all of what he said. And then at that point, 
we are able to do the next piece, the fourth piece, which is to make the request. And in verse 11, Nehemiah asked God to go with him, to be with him, to soften the king's heart as he went before the king to make a request of him. So the first part we talked about, we're talking about here is facing the problem, acknowledging the problem, acknowledging that it is a problem, even if it's not your problem, but it is a problem that God has called you to deal with, to address, and we have to acknowledge it, and we have to start with praying and asking God for guidance. Our second point today is talking about preparation and planning. Too often, when we see a problem and we feel like we're going to go and do something about it, we don't take the time to prepare. We do not take the time to plan. We just jump into action. We don't think it through. We don't pray enough. We don't stay on our knees long enough to get clear guidance from God. And many times we fail in what we're trying to achieve because we did not take the time to prepare and we did not take the time to plan. When we look at Nehemiah 2, um, I am going to read this to you again out of the New Living Translation. We will see that there was planning, there was thought, there was preparation before Nehemiah took any action in solving the problem or addressing the problem that God had called him to address. Nehemiah 2 and 1 starts with early the following spring in the month of Nisan during the 20th year of King Axerxes' reign. I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified. Let me stop for a minute and just say that in those days, in that culture, coming before the king in anything other than a happy, jovial way could get you killed. The king did not need downers around him. He did not need depressed people around him. He did not need mad people around him. He did not need sad people around him. And if you came in his presence with an attitude that he didn't understand, he could literally order your head to be cut off. So yes, Nehemiah had reason to be scared because he was looking sad. In verse 3, it says, But I replied, Long live the king! How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, Well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, If it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king, with the queen's settings beside him, asked, How long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. I also said to the king, If it please the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for a house for myself. And the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. Again, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his word. So in chapter one, we see that Nehemiah prayed that the king would be favorable to his request. He had already mapped out exactly what he was going to ask him and how he was going to go about completing this task. When he went before the king, he made his request. And because he had prayed, because he had prepared, because he had a plan, the king was favorable to granting his request. So after we look at preparation and planning for a task that God has called us to do, a third thing we need to do, the third point we want to talk about here is that we really need to make sure we understand the entirety of the problem. Again, sometimes we fail because we don't take the time to plan or prepare 
But sometimes we fail in what we're doing because we really don't understand what the issue is. When we look at Nehemiah, the second chapter again, verses 13 through 15, again, I'm reading to you out of the New King, excuse me, out of the New Living Translation. The Word of God says, After dark, I went through the valley gate, past the jackal's well, and over to the dung gate to inspect the broken walls and burnt gates. Now, he's, he's there now. He's in Jerusalem, and he's looking around. Verse 14 says, Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but my donkey could not get through the rubble. Verse 15 says, So, though it was still dark, I went up to the Kidron Valley instead, inspecting the wall before I turned back and entered again at the valley gate. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, doing of his word. We need to know what we're dealing with. We see this a lot today with people when they're interacting on a personal level. Someone will come to you and say, hey, you know, I have this problem. Um, this person is doing this to me. And we just shoot off without thought, without prayer, without meditation, without getting more information. Well, if I were you, I would do blank. We need to understand the whole problem before we start moving forward or advising somebody to move forward with an action. That's part of the problem not only that we see on pers in personal interactions when people ask uh, for advice. Sometimes they're asking the wrong person for advice. But too often without understanding the whole problem, without understanding the whole picture, without having all of the information, we shoot off with what you should do. We shoot off with what I'm going to do for you. We need to take the time to understand the entire picture. This is what Nehemiah is doing here, looking to see just where and how badly this wall is broken down. When we have a clear idea of the picture, then we have a clear idea of the action that we should be taking. Heard a, a minister not too long ago talk about the fact that he was in his church office right before service and a lady came in and she had a, a, a black eye and she, she told the pastor, you know, just before he's getting ready to go out to preach, you know, this is what my husband did to me. And he's getting a little upset because he's thinking, you know, what kind of man is this that would do something like this to his wife? And he, before though, he took any action to, um, you know, chastise the man or to do whatever he's going to do. He did ask to have him brought to the office. The man came to the office, but he saw that the man, his parishioner, looked worse than his wife. He had scratches on his face. He had his shirt torn. He was, he was looking pretty bad. He was bleeding. And the pastor asked what happened. And, and, and the man said, I was driving my car and my wife got upset. She started cr scratching my face and tearing at my shirt. And I put my arm out to try to protect myself and to try to continue to drive. And in doing that, I accidentally did hit her. And she did get this black eye from my putting my arm out, but I didn't strike her. If that's what she told you, I was trying to a protect myself, but also continue to drive and not run into a tree. So again, the pastor could have jumped to a conclusion based on one side of the story, but he decided to get the other side of the story before he took any action. And obviously the woman wanted him to do something for her to come into the pastor's office right before he was scheduled to go out to preach, but he wisely got the whole story before he moved forward. So we've talked about, first of all, facing the problem, understanding that there is a problem and God is calling us to address it. Secondly, we talked about the fact that you need to prepare and to plan before you take action. The third thing we've talked about is fully understanding what you're dealing with. And the fourth thing that we're going to talk about right now is keeping details to yourself. And this is kind of important because this gets us into a lot of trouble. God will call us to do something. God will give us a vision. God will give us a plan. He has given it. He has laid out for us what he wants us to do. And it is a big work. It is a grand work. It is something that's phenomenal. And many times after God has given us this information, we run out and start telling everybody. Let's, let's look at the example of Joseph in Genesis 37, 
uh, five, the verses five through 11. I won't read it to you, but in, in this passage, we have Joseph, the Joseph with the coat of many colors, Joseph, and he's had several dreams here. Dreams where that indicated that he would at some point in his life rule over his brothers. Rather than keep that information to himself, he naively went and told his brothers, hey, guess what I dreamt? I dreamt you guys are going to be bowing down to me one day type of thing. And all that did was create even more animosity and jealousy with his brothers. God didn't tell him to go and tell his whole family what he had shared with them. God shared something with him to prepare him for the level of greatness that he had in store for him. But Joseph decided for whatever reason that he had to go tell everybody. And obviously that was not a good thing to do. Too often we do the same thing. Oh, God told me that I'm going to do this. He told me that I'm going to move there. He told me that I'm going to uh, start this thing. I'm going to start this business. I'm going to start this church and my kids going to this college. God told me all of these things and all you're doing by spreading this everywhere is that you're engendering hatred and animosity and jealousy. Trust me, I know this from personal experience. You're not thinking that way because you're not a person that would be jealous. You're not a person that would carry acrimony because of something that someone has, in, that God has in store for them. But just because you don't think that way, trust me, there are others that do. You're related to some of them. Don't share your vision with everybody. Don't share the plans of those visions with everybody until God has told you now is the time to let everybody know what I'm getting ready to do through you. But until then, keep it to yourself because all you're doing is creating more opposition to your work than you need to deal with. In verses, uh, excuse me, in Nehemiah 2 and 12, we read, and this is Nehemiah talking, I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anybody about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding. And then in Nehemiah 2 and 16, he goes on and says again, the city officials did not know I had been out there or what I was doing for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. So Nehemiah wisely, like Joseph, Nehemiah wisely kept all the details to himself until it was time for him to share with the appropriate stakeholders what God was getting ready to do. And as we continue to study Nehemiah, we will find out that he had a lot of opposition. He would have had even more had he gone out earlier and told of all the plans that God had put into his heart for doing this work. The fifth and final point today is the power of one. We read in Nehemiah 2 and 18, then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. They, then he's talking about the people who had, were living in Jerusalem at this point. They replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. And then when we jumped over to Nehemiah 4, 6th verse, he says, at last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city. For the people had worked with enthusiasm. Now keep in mind that there were many people that had gone back to Jerusalem. This is not a city where it was just one or two people there. There were a lot of people there. But because the, they were living in the rubble, as we do today, they were living amongst a lot of junk all over the place, the, the, the remains of their city being burnt down. They were discouraged. They were despondent. They didn't have a lot of hope. So they just figured that they would live with things the way they are. Again, too many of us do that today. But there was one person that came into the city, one person that came on the scene, one person that had 
heard from God and had taken it upon himself to do what God had told him to do, to leave his comfortable job, to leave his comfortable home, to leave his comfortable existence and go to a place of rubble, go to a place of despair, go to a place where people were hopeless and to tell them we can do this. One person can change an entire atmosphere. One person can change the entire environment. One person can make a difference. And that person just may be you. You see, we live in rubble. We live in brokenness. This world that we're in is broken. And God is calling, not God may call. God is calling each and every one of us who are called by his name to go into the environments that he sends us into to fix that which is broken. It could be your family is broken. It could be that your finances are broken. It could be that your spiritual life is broken. It could be that your home, your career, your society, your nation are broken. And instead of us looking for somebody needs to fix that, somebody needs to do something about that, somebody needs to address this issue, maybe God is calling you to do it. One person can make a, a, a tremendous dif difference in the lives of everyone in their space. Just recently, I was in the city of Atlanta and I wanted to ensure that my grandson who had never, one of my grandsons who had never been to the Martin Luther King Memorial, I wanted to make sure that he saw that before we left. So we went to the tomb of Dr. Martin Luther King and Mrs. Coretta Scott King. We went to the museum and examined the artifacts. We went and saw the house where Dr. King was born. And it, every I've, I've, I've been there before, but every time I go there, it's a, there's an impact for me, not only thinking about what he went through to give me and those around me the privileges and the rights that we enjoy today, but just the fact that one man, now he didn't do it by himself. I, I'm not suggesting that there were many who worked alongside him who died in the work of bringing this nation to a place where it looked at the fact that all of its citizens were not free. But this one man, because he took the, made the decision to stand up. And like Nehemiah, he was living for, for, for a black man of that time, a pretty comfortable life. He was a minister. He had gone to college. He had gotten his PhD. He could very easily have sat back and preached in his pulpit and talked about, it's a shame this is going on. But at a very young age, he heard God's call, just as Nehemiah did. And he put his life on hold, just as Nehemiah did. And that one man, with the, the, the blessing and with the hand of God upon him, changed this society. Nehemiah changed his society by what he did. Maybe God is calling you right now to change your society. It may not be the whole nation. It may not be the whole state. It may not be the whole world. It might be your family. It might be your neighborhood. It might be your kid's school. It might be something that you consider small, but you have no idea of the ripple effect of what you can achieve, what you can change by answering God's call. So in conclusion today, I want to say again, whatever your broken wall is, whatever the broken wall is that God is calling you to, because this is not a, if God calls you, he's calling you, he's calling you. It's just which assignment, what is he having you focus on? So what is that broken wall? Is it broken dreams, broken homes, broken marriage, broken relationships, broken body, broken psyches? We've got a lot of mental health issues happening today? Is there somebody that you can help? I'm not saying that you are a psychiatrist or a psychologist or that you have the ability to, to prescribe drugs or whatever, but there may be something 
that God is calling you to do in someone's life that will make it easier, this walk easier for them. Broken finances, broken spirits. We're surrounded by brokenness. We ourselves have brokenness. Find that wall that God is calling you to rebuild because there is nothing that is so broken that God cannot fix it. There is nothing that is so difficult that God cannot handle it. There's no circumstance that is too complicated for God to make right. There's nothing in your past or somebody else's past that is so sordid, that's so bad that God cannot address it. There's nothing that is so wrong that God can't make it right. But he is calling on us to be his hands and his feet, his instruments in this world to right those wrongs. Will you answer that call today? Or are you going to point to someone else and say, somebody needs to do something about that? I'm going to ask you to examine your heart. Ask God, what are you calling me to do? Which wall are you calling me to rebuild? And keep in mind that it's harder to rebuild than it is to build. It's so much easier when you have a clean slate. But there are no clean slates. There's brokenness around us. There's rubble around us. That's why this series is being called Living in the Rubble, because we have to rebuild things that are broken and not just say, I'm looking for a clean slate. That's why so many people are running. They're running away from their families. They're running away from their marriages. They're running away from their jobs. They're running away from their communities. They're running because they're looking for a clean slate. But guess what? Wherever you go, there's some rubble there. So why not start on the rubble in the place that you are right now? Ask the Lord to show you which wall it is that he's asking you to rebuild. Pray to him as Nehemiah did to make sure that he is showing you and equipping you with what you need to move forward and then move forward. To do this and to hear, to have this communication with God, you have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to know that he sent his son into this earth more than 2,000 years ago to pay a price that we were not equipped to pay. If we believe this, if we accept this, and if we build our lives on this, he has assured us not only will we have an abundant life in this life, a life that he has guided, he has prepared, that he has designated for us long before we were even born, but then we will also have life with him in the next life. So if you believe this, your next step is if you're not doing the work, if you are not doing what he called you to do, is to ask the Lord to clearly show you what is the work that he has called you to. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then I have news for you. There's no better day than today. No better day than this day to say, Lord, I don't understand all of what these preachers and these people are talking about, but I do understand that what you are calling to do, if, I do understand that if I live according to the way you taught, not religious tradition, not dogma, not theology, but if I live according to the teachings of Jesus, that I will have a life in this life that will be wonderful, that will be peaceful. It won't be trouble-free, but that's what I want. And I want even more to be with you in the next. And if that's you today, then congratulations. Let's pray a quick prayer. And then you will be a part of the family of God. And you'll be starting on the most wonderful adventure, the most wonderful journey that you could ever start on in this life. The quick prayer we're going to pray goes like this. Lord Jesus, I come to you today, first and foremost, acknowledging that you are God. I thank you for being my Savior, my Redeemer. I thank you for coming on this earth and teaching us how to live. But Lord, you also died and took my place when you went on that cross. 
and paid my debt when you decided to die in my, in my stead. But the wonderful thing about it is on that third day, you got up, you got out of that tomb and you have now all power in your hand. You ascended back up to the Lord, but you came or you gave us a promise that you would come back. And Lord, I believe it. As Romans 10 and 9 says, I believe this and I am now verbally con confessing or stating this. And through these actions, Lord, I have now asked and I know that I've received adoption into your family. All that I am and all that I ever will be, I commit to you right now. I thank you, I praise you, I glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, if you prayed this prayer with me and you are sincere in what you're saying, you have now become a child of the Most High King. And your next step is to unite with a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. Not to unite, unite with a religious practice, but to unite with people who believe God's word, God's word alone, without a whole lot of other stuff that people like to throw in there. I mean, if they want to, that's fine, but find a church that teaches God's word and unite with like-minded Christians. And the wonderful thing about that is that you can do that in your local community. There are a lot of bad churches out there. I'm the first to admit that, but there are some good ones. But you can also reunite with us. We are a virtual ministry, and we would be more than happy to accept you into our family here at His Gospel Christian Fellowship, no matter where in the world you reside. There are numbers that are appearing on your screen right now that tells you how to get in contact with us. You can text us, you can call us, you can email us, and a member of the ministerial staff will be in contact with you we be, be, would be more than honored to walk with you as you walk this journey and you walk toward eternity with Jesus. So we thank you for being here with us today. And we're going to now go into our benediction, as I always do. I'm going to read to you two verses from the book of Jude. I'm reading to you out of the, the King James Version. The word of God says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. God bless you. God loves you. And we're just going to ask that you stay tuned for another minute or so to hear the, amounts, the announcements that we have for you today. Be blessed. If you're looking for a church home, look no further. You can become a member of HGCF no matter where you live in the world. We would love to have you become a part of our family. If you'd like more information about our church, or if you'd like to join with us, just send an email to hisgospel at hisgospel.org. Again, that's hisgospel at hisgospel.org. We'd love to hear from you. Giving is a part of worship. If you don't already give virtually, now is a great time to do so. You can go to our website and click on the Give button at the top of our landing page. Your giving is a matter between you and the Lord. However, we do want you to know that when you give to HGCF, that the money given is used directly and exclusively in supporting God's work. No member of the leadership of His Gospel receives a salary or a stipend from the church.